So uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, really excited to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm a pathologist. So I want to tell you um, some of the work that uh, translation work we're doing using some of these amazing tools that uh, our computer science colleagues have, have uh, really pioneered. Um, and really, um, because of my kind of training and as a pathologist, the thing that I'm interested in is understanding if machines uh, interpret slides the same way that I was trained to do during uh, kind of my residency. Um, and, and I think uh, you'll see why that's important from a kind of uh, transparency point of view that was, that was brought up. So ultimately, um, we're going to be focusing on deep learning, which is a subset of AI. And uh, I think this is a really important because um, we need to kind of um, transition to kind of a, a automated and objective image analysis. Now, why is this so? Um, our, our computer is really better than humans at, at doing these tasks. And, um, you know, this is a histolog histology image, image, and this is kind of our cartoon of how a human um, versus a computer look, looks at this image. And, 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 and as we said before, a lot of the, a lot of the kind of uh, outperforming or competition between humans and computers uh, is, is perhaps unfair and, uh, and not really relevant to, uh, to, to the, the field moving forward. So uh, at the top, you see how kind of a human, um, uh, w we think like algorithms too, when we see a, a piece of tissue, we think of kind of a decision tree. Is this normal or abnormal? If it's abnormal, it's an infection or, or, or a neoplasm. And if it's a neoplasm, then we try to subclassify it based on morphologic features under the microscope. Now, now one of the key differences I want to I want to emphasize here is that um, histology is never done in isolation, and, and and a lot of this technological advancements that we've seen is really uh, H and E analysis. So the idea that um, uh, you know H and E analysis alone is gonna is gonna kind of supersede it, um, kind of our molecular tools is uh, I think uh, short sighted. We're gonna need an integrated approach. So. So which one's better, and, and, and why do we need to transition to uh, automated approach if, if humans are actually very, very good at these, uh, at these diagnostic tasks? And, 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 and at least from my point of view, this is the key um, message that, that, that I see, is that um, this is the cost of a gigabyte of memory over the last 40 years. And the cost has gone down uh, almost a million fold. So what that means is that we're making different decisions today, right? The, the amount of data that we can do, use on our phones is astronomically more than, 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 our, than our kind of uh, smartphones that we had five years ago. So what that means is we're going to utilize uh, medical um, infrastructure differently. And you can see as the cost of, of uh, storing images and storing digital data decreases, um, there is a, 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 all these technological advancements are really leading to uh, increased interest in um, storing digitized uh, medical information. So this is the kind of, um, uh, you see an inverse relationship between the number of CT scans done in the last 40 years, and you can see that we just don't have the manpower or woman power or person power to, to keep up with the amount of diagnostic tests we're doing. And you can see uh, almost a vertical kind of growth in digital pathology recently because of the innovations in this field. And, 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 and really, the amount of data that we're generating is just too much for a human to do. And, and that's why I think we need uh, um, um, artificial intelligence, digital pathology. Uh, it's really from an automated point of view to handle the, the, va the, the vast amount of information. Now, um, kind of there, there's traditional approaches and then there's a the deep learning approaches. I luckily came after the, 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 the traditional approaches, so I had to kind of learn less to kind of uh, um, begin um, participating in this field. So the traditional approaches is you take a slide, you take a, um, an image, and then you have to handcraft features. So you have to have a, uh, a kind of a, a computer scientist try to work with a pathologist and try to see um, which features should we engineer into um, these uh, kind of um, uh, computer algorithms that can detect these things and quantify them. And then, and then once we quantify these features, we can then use uh, kind of algorithms to classify this image, right? So these are the traditional uh, approaches. Now, what's wrong with these traditional approaches? Well, um, if a picture is worth a, a thousand words, it means that for every picture, you're going to have uh, you're going to have to make a thousand features, right? And that's very, very difficult because some of the things that we see are very, very hard to kind of quantify or, or engineer into um, uh, algorithm uh, into these kind of features. So, um, really, um, the, the 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 why deep learning is so important 
is because you don't have to do this manual engineering of features, right? So the new way of, of, of kind of doing computer vision is now you can feed large amounts of images, these image tiles that we've talked about, they're annotated, you can feed them through a neural network, and then the neural network will, in a kind of data-driven fashion, develop these features that we're traditionally doing manually. And because of this, it can do, uh, it can do this much more uh, efficiently and much, uh, generate much more features, so you can store millions of features in these neural networks, and as the kind of image, once your test image passes through these trained networks, is going to start synthesizing uh, low-level features like lines and dots into higher-level, more complex features. And if you uh, give it enough data, the, 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 I guess the assumption is that it's going to learn uh, these more complex features. So um, when did the first milestone um, really happen? Um, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's through this ImageNet competition that we've heard about. So this is kind of the Olympics of computer vision where people would bring their algorithms and try to compete who had the best uh, image recognition software. Um, and you can see why. Um, so uh, when this competition first started, the kind of traditional tools uh, had an error rate of about 27%, um, let's say. And you can see why a computer may make a mistake, right? If you engineer um, it to recognize a cat by just ears and eyes, um, you know, this, this looks very similar, right? So uh, this is actually a very difficult competition um, for, for, for traditional approaches that just fo focus on um, these features that it would look for in an image. And this is kind of just for a comparison, a human in this competition would make about a 3% error rate, right? So um, way, way off what, uh, um, what humans could do in these kind of image recognition tasks. So in 2012, um, Jeffrey Hinton uh, uh, from, from Toronto really uh, introduced this uh, data-driven approach to image recognition. And you can see there was a quantum a fall in the error rate, right? So he went from um, uh, 23, 24% error in the, in, in the previous year to 16% error. And really, uh, since then, um, revolutionized how image analysis is done. And you can see every year, sequentially, modifications to the kind of architecture um, really improved um, uh, really his pioneering work and, and uh, about three years ago when the image uh, when, the, when this uh, image net uh, um, uh, cl uh, closed or concluded um, computers were just as good as humans at recognizing these a thousand different classes of cats dogs airplanes so obviously um, people uh, in the medical field that do medical imaging uh, uh, it, it, it caught its attention because a lot of important decisions are made based on human interpretation um, and so there's a lot of these papers that are coming out, uh, whether um, deep learning can, can kind of uh, improve the way we, we, we carry out medical diagnostics, right? So we heard of some of these papers. Um, so this is kind of where my lab uh, was getting started, and we said, that let's dabble in this. Um, uh, pathology is an exciting field. Why don't we uh, add our two cents into the, in, into the, um, into the equation? So we, we had no computer science expertise, so we... Um, we hired some students, and this was our first experiment, just to show you how easy this is, right? So we're not experts. This is a, 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 a full a whole slide image, about a gigabyte or two gigabytes in size. There's these fragments of tissue, and then these fragments show you, this is an immunostain that shows you the ground truth. This is where the tumor is on these slides. So you can see there's some fragments that have no tumor at all, and some fragments are really kind of heavily riddled with, with, with cancer. So we trained, um, um, we trained uh, kind of a, a out-of-the-box neural network with normal brain tissue and, and, and cancerous uh, tissue. Um, and you can see using these kind of class activation maps, we can now compare just how good a computer can recognize um, uh, uh, the cancer in these fragments of tissue. And you can see almost a one-to-one -one overlap with this immunostain, right? So this is extremely robust, right? In science, we see someone do something and we try to repeat it in the lab and it takes six months of optimization to do something. Uh, whereas um, even if you zoomed in and in, as we zoomed in, even the cells trickling through the brain um, were able to be caught uh, at very, very high magnification. So we thought, wow, this is amazing. How, uh, this is really easy. This is, a, um, a, you know, this is such a powerful technology. So if it's so powerful, if it's so easy, why, why really is, uh, uh, is it still, uh, as we heard from the experts, 10 years away, right? Why is it so far away from realization? Um, and, and, and I think that was just the first milestone, just to show that deep learning is, in fact, a very, very powerful tool that can be used in this manner. 
but there's uh, a lot of uh, barriers as we as we learned about uh, and, and some kind of um, and some themes that keep emerging. Um, and really, a lot of these breakthroughs have been in supervised classification tasks, right? So, uh, and, and we'll go why that's um, perhaps a limited uh, application of this technology. So I think the second milestone, as we've heard by many of the speakers, is to move towards unsupervised analysis because that's why I went to school for five years. It's very easy for me to pick up on uh, a, a, a diagnosis that's in the textbook, but my job is to find anomalies in, in the slides that I look at and work those up more extensively. Write a case report that's going to change management down the road, right? That's what an expert is, right? It's, it's ability to understand what's not in the textbook. And that's what I think unsupervised analysis is all about. And then, and then the third, uh, kind of the third milestone I think that's kind of uh, needs to be addressed before this technology can really uh, make an impact is uh, improve its interpretability, right? So, um, and, and we'll see what that means. So, um, what's unsupervised uh, learning, right? So, um, imagine you picture this: you have um, you, you 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 have a little baby, uh, and you give him Lego, and um, a supervised task would be to instruct the baby to take the different color Legos and put them in very well annotated uh, um, paper bags, right? So put the red Lego in the red bag, put the green Lego in the green bag. And this is actually a very, as we, as, as we heard, a very easy task to monitor how intelligent your baby is. If uh, you, can, you can see how many red Legos are in the red bag, how many yellow Legos are in the yellow bag. Um, and it's very, very easy to, um, uh, to kind of quantify. But really all it's doing is you're, um, if you were to buy black Lego and you put it into your kid's Lego box, you now have to make new classes because where, where, where is the black Lego going to go, right? So um, this creates a problem because every time they go to school and they exchange Lego with their friends, this, this, this game that you've made for your baby is no longer valid, right? You, you have no way to know if he's getting smart at school, if he's, where is he putting the black Lego piece? The unsupervised approach is don't tell the baby anything at all, right? So, um, and eventually, you know, this is where I think um, we really get excited about seeing how babies learn, right? So uh, eventually, if you, if you let the baby play with the Lego enough, it's going to figure out that, hey, red, red Lego goes in one bin, and let's put the yellow, yellow, yellow Lego in a different bin. So they've recreated this problem that you've made in a kind of unsupervised manner based on just kind of logical, um, uh, finding logical patterns in data. And the beauty is if, if, they, if they go to school and exchange and get different color Lego, they will make a new bin to put that different color Lego in. But the real excitement is that maybe one day the baby goes to school and learns something and it does the same task, but instead of putting it in different colors, organizes it based on different shapes, right? And that's the exciting part of unsupervised learning is that you can now do things that you haven't taught the computer. And just to kind of explain how important this is, um, we have kind of uh, the, the leader. Uh, so Young Lacoon is one of the Turing uh, Prize winners with uh, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, trying to describe how important unsupervised learning is. So if um, most, human learn most human animal learning is in fact unsupervised, so if intelligence was a cake, the whole cake would be the unsupervised learning. And just the supervised learning that we said is so important for computer scientists is just really the icing on the cake, right? So imagine just that, that analogy of how, how far we need to go. If, that's, if, this, if this is true, we're nowhere near to trying to implement uh, uh, these tools in a kind of way that um, uh, um, dramatically uh, improves efficiency and is transformative. Now, what about the third aim, right? So we said that um, we need to be able to provide transparency. And you may have heard that these neural networks are in fact almost like a black box. We know what goes in, we know what comes out, we can, we can easily evaluate them, but we have no way of knowing how they came to those decisions. Um, are certain tumors more bloody? Is it learning that, uh, is, is the computer learning that blood is associated with a specific type of tumor? That's really dangerous because if the surgeon changes and they're, they have a different technique, that's going to cause problems. Now, some people say, well, isn't a human a black box? Um, here, are two, here are two different types of gliomas, brain tumors that are kind of related. Glioblastoma is a very aggressive tumor. 
kills a patient in about one to three years. Oligodendroglioma, it's a cousin, but much more indolent tumor where a patient has a kind of expected survival of 10 to 15 years. So um, if we gave it to a pathologist and asked her, what's the diagnosis? How do we know that her, whatever she writes in her report is not um, kind of, how do we examine that, right? And, and, and the way we examine that is by, we know how people were trained, right? So how I was trained is, if, you, if the cells look like potatoes, it's a glioblastoma. If they had that fried egg perinuclear halo, um, it, it, it's an oligodendroglioma. And it sounds funny, but even when I write my reports, I include those words. So if someone halfway across the world is reading it, they know what I looked for and what I not. And that's the transparency aspect of the human report, right? We know exactly what was ruled in and what was ruled out just by reading and not, even without having access to the slide. So I think that's where the explainability or interpretability comes in. And here's just a kind of a classic example um, where the inception, this kind of uh, award-winning um, uh, neural network, correctly classified this picture as a panda. You add just a little bit of this fuzz, this kind of 1980s fuzz to, to the image. Nothing really changes for the human, but somehow you went from a very modest, correct prediction to a, to a very highly inaccurate um, uh, diagnosis of a gibbon, right? So who knows why that's the case? Is it because the tree changed colors with this fuzz and uh, the computer was learning on the fuzz? Is it the face? Is there something about the face that's similar? Um, uh, and, and I guess that's what worries people, right? And this is kind of just the kind of social media um, approach of uh, how, how, uh, how, this, how this problem looks, right? So very big issue, right? Um, very big issue if we don't know how computers are making decisions. So um, how do we resolve these? And I think how we resolve this is, 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 is the kind of theme that uh, we're seeing come up is that we need to transition to unsupervised approaches um, uh, 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 um, to analyze a lot of the outputs that neural networks are doing. And I, I like unsupervised approaches because you can never be wrong, right? We, 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 we know that in supervised, you're either wrong or right. But in unsupervised, it's a little bit more hazy of, of what a good result is. So um, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a good research tool as well. Um, so what, what does unsupervised learning look like? So, well, supervised, right, is kind of, there's, there's two different ways to approach supervised learning. Either you have continuous data or, or discrete data. So if you have continuous data, um, uh, you can kind of correlate, um, let's say, the, the, uh, the housing prices uh, based on the size of the house and try to find correlations. And then you can try to predict uh, in a kind of continuous manner what the price of a house is based on, um, the house size, right? Whereas a discrete uh, kind of classification problem would be something like your email, where you get spam and no spam, and then, you know, based on, uh, is it from a trusted domain, Office 365, um, is there certain words in it, uh, Viagra, um, uh, you know, you use those kind of uh, things to draw a line about um, what exactly, um, um, if it should go into your inbox or, 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 or your junk mail. So unsupervised um, is quite different as we learn. There's no labels. Um, it's more about grouping things that have similar properties. So uh, if you were looking at continuous data, you would use clustering, um, PSNE, principal component maps. And the idea here is that although we don't know what these clusters represent uh, in theory, um, we know that cluster three is further away from cluster one and two. So chances are there's something um, about cluster one and two that's more similar to each other than to cluster three. Um, and you can do this kind of, you can discretize this by using uh, kind of uh, hierarchical clustering where you um, uh, take, uh, you know, you use the kind of, you know, we've seen this quite with gene expression analysis, right? You, you use the patterns of data to group things into different uh, clusters and then you try to find why those clusters um, were grouped together. So, um, that, that's what my um, that's what my lab is interested in. Um, it's really to try to find the implicit uh, structures of how these neural networks are making decisions uh, using these kind of uh, unsupervised tools. And the real idea is here: can we go into the network and find which parts of the neural network, um, if they represent human constructs, uh, is there an epithelial feature in the neural network? Is there a is there a blood feature? Is there a necrosis feature? Is there features in there that resemble how we look at images, or is it completely random? Is it is it is it just learning um, 
pixels that, have no, that are nonsensical to us. So um, the first way we did that was through kind of an unsupervised approach. So we, um, um, we, we took, uh, we took, we took 80,000 images, 80,000 tiles, um, probably spanning um, about 100 cases. And then we um, grouped them into 13 different classes. Um, so, um, and these are the classes here. You have normal brain tissue, white matter, gray matter, cerebellar tissue. These are all normal brain structures, uh, dura. Then you have your kind of, on the other extreme, you have your pathological tissues. So your lymphomas, your gliomas, uh, your different types of tumors that are really, really ugly. And then in between, you kind of have this non-diagnostic stuff. So here, here's where the blood glows, goes. Here's where the cloth that may get incorporated into the tissue goes. And, and, and we thought that this is, a, if you probably polled, polled 100 pathologists, this is how they're taught, right? So again, normal, abnormal, non-diagnostic, right? So um, we now um, can make uh, very reasonable uh, assumptions of how these clusters should be arranged by an intelligent human that's been trained for a long time. So um, now that we kind of know how the data should be structured, we can train a neural network, supervised, teach it what these different classes are, and then see how it's organizing the data using these clustering techniques, right? And then we can see, is it doing it the same way a human would, right? So again, we take a, a kind of a, a trained neural network, we run these images through, and then instead of uh, trying to classify it, we, um, we use the kind of the, 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 the learned representations deep into the neural network. So these are the high level features that it learned and try to see how it's organizing them in this kind of two dimensional grid, knowing that the closer two groups are to one another probably means there's some similarities in the patterns of, uh, 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 of the tissue. So now we can kind of go head to head and see. And in fact, what we found was that these are the normal, um, there, there is some similarities. Um, so this is, these are your kind of normal brain tissues, gray matter, white matter, cerebellum. Um, these are your kind of non-diagnostic, your blood, your necrosis. Dura was actually placed here. So we think it's kind of a, a posse cellular or, low, or, or, or tissue of low cellularity. And then you have in this blue cloud, uh, things that are obviously cellular, right? So um, it kind of figured out that cellular things should be grouped together. The interesting thing is there's kind of other higher order ways that um, as a pathologist, I can see that it organized in an intelligible way, right? So the, um, all these dots here represent individual tiles of glioma. And you can see that positionally, these are the closest to normal glial tissue. So um, even though it's abnormal, it somehow found that those should be grouped together. Moving, moving up, this is lymphoma, right? So this light blue area, these are, these are patches of lymphoma. These are discohesive tumors. Um, so again, it's, it's interesting to, to think that, um, uh, you know, both gliomas and, and, and lymphomas are discohesive, while this purple area is metastasis and this is meningiomas, these are cohesive tumors. So it somehow uh, is perhaps, again, these are just uh, my interpretations. Um, there is some correlations with how, um, humans interpret uh, uh, tissue or, or, the, or even the biology that we know about these tumors correlate with how uh, 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 these different classes are organized in the neural network. So what can we do with these TSNE plots that can help kind of accelerate the application of deep learning into uh, medical image analysis? So one way we're using this is to kind of improve the visualization ability of our, uh, of our tools. So we can take a test image. This is uh, uh, this is a slide that the computer has never seen before. We randomly sample it, so we get about 100 tiles, and then we try, use, a, use the TSNE as a dartboard, and we see where those tiles land. And you can see here that these red tiles represent these kind of randomly sampled areas of the test slide, and they completely overlap with the glioma cloud, right? So um, we, can, we can make the assumption that these, these test images look very, very similar to the, uh, to the trained images that we use to kind of uh, fine tune our neural network. Now look what happens when you present to it a case that's never seen before, right? So if you use probability scores, if you use the kind of uh, traditional approaches, um, if, if you present to it a new class that, that, that you've never trained the neural network to recognize, it has to put it into a class, right? Just like that Lego problem, right? Where is the black Lego piece going to go, right? It has to put it somewhere. But when you use these kind of unsupervised approaches, here's a hemangioblastoma. We, ne we never 
trained our, our network on a hemangioblastoma. When you look at the kind of um, um, dimensionality, dimension, dimensionality reduction plot, you see that it forms its own cloud. So it, 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 now we have a way to detect anomalies in data. So if, if there was a slide that went through um, that represented a, a type of tumor that was anomalous, so was there a lot of inflammation that would have implications for uh, immunotherapy, we're now able to uh, monitor these kind of unexpected uh, pathologies uh, by using these um, um, unsupervised um, visualization tools. So again, these, these were all kind of qualitative, right? So um, you can argue, well, I would have drawn that kind of cloud a little bit differently, you know, um, you know, maybe you're over-interpreting the data. Um, so we wanted to do something more um, discreet, right? Where we're not drawing those borders around the tumors. So we moved to kind of a discreet way to classify data in an unsupervised manner, which is the clustering, right? And we wanted to see if, if we can cluster the, if we can cluster different tumor types uh, like this, and these are kind of our features, which kind of are similar to gene expression. Can we find specific features of the computer optimized that are similar uh, that we can sort of correlate with these human understandable features? So to do this, we needed to move away from 13 classes. So um, we needed to move to something much larger. Um, th these are the, the, the different types of brain tumors um, as, um, as listed in kind of our Holy Bible or WHO, World Health Organization, classification guide, and you can see that um, they're listed in chapters based on understood biology. So experts came uh, from all over the world and they said which tumors should go together, right? So you have a chapter on gliomas, you have a chapter on meningiomas, um, because those have similar biology. So there's different subtypes of every tumor, uh, and they can be grouped based on their biology. Again, the, the real interesting thing is when you read the chapters, there's also some kind of expert level information. Um, where um, it's also grouped based on morphology, right? So um, gliomas are typically infiltrative. They have uh, kind of uh, this kind of discohesive pattern. Um, but the cool thing about this is, is that some features, like high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, are in fact shared between gliomas, lymphomas. So when we go to school, we're taught that when you see a small round blue cell tumor, you can't assume it's a glioma. You need to rule out a lymphoma because that has a different management plan. Um, so these are important things to always think about. I'm not going to worry about a meningioma. I'm, I'm going to worry more about a lymphoma, right? So these kind of ways to group things in multiple dimensions um, is an important part of uh, being a pathologist. So again, so we, um, what we did is we tried to see how a computer would organize a large number of different tumor types. So we took um, 1,691 whole slide images about 850,000 image tiles, spanning 74 different classes. Um, and then we ran them through the network. And then again, just before the classification step, we stopped it and said, what does this data look like uh, based on the feature vectors that are being passed through the different uh, the layers? And then we can use those much like expression values for different genes and cluster them based on computer optimized features. And then, a kind of variant of the class activation map, we can use feature activation maps to see do those features that are found in certain clusters represent some morphological correlate, right? So um, we're moving away from classes and moving towards um, feature representations, right? So um, just the way if I see a cat, it needs, to have, it needs to have ears, it needs to have eyes, it needs to have whiskers. We're moving to kind of deconstructing diagnoses into features. So, um, Basically, uh, uh, th this is a summary of the same thing, and this is what the data looks like. So um, on the um, on the y-axis here, we have the 74. I think in, in this particular experiment, there are 78 classes. So these are different classes, and then here is 512 features um, that the computer is quantifying before it makes the classification. So we can use those features just like gene expression values and cluster different classes, and you can see. Um, we saw interesting patterns, right? So uh, the chapter on meningiomas, most of these uh, most of these meningioma types clustered in this um, this cluster of the of the of the hierarchical map, right? And then you have a glioma cluster. Interestingly, the glioma cluster in this particular experiment 
was near the glial tissue, right? So there's a lot of interesting things that we can start to hypothesize of how these organizational patterns are, are, are kind of organized um, with the computer not knowing that there's different meningioma subtypes, right? So let's zoom in on some of these and see what they look like. So um, the color code here is based on the chapter in the WHO classification guide. So in this particular cluster, you see there's a, a, a big row of salmon color. So then we zoom in here and you can see that um, this particular cluster has eight, eight tumors, papillary meningioma, fibrous meningioma, transitional meningioma, atypical meningioma. So seven of the eight are meningiomas. So it's somehow group those together based on the kind of overarching biology that we understand. Um, so that, we thought that was interesting. Now, interestingly, here's an error, right? So um, the eighth class is a hemangioblastoma, nothing to do with meningiomas. But you can see, interestingly, it grouped with the angiomatous meningioma. So uh, uh, if you understand Greek, if you took ancient Greek, angio means vessels, hemangio. So uh, again, you can start hypothesizing that perhaps these were clustered together because of other real features that were um, um, that were uh, that, are, that, are, that are present in 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 in, in high um, in high degree in these tumor types, right? So it's hard to know what an error is um, in these types of uh, unsupervised approaches. Here's another cluster, right? So this red cluster at the bottom. This is um, this was interesting. Obviously, that sticks out. Um, another group of eight. Um, Glioblastoma, astrocytoma is a, is a type of glioblastoma. Oh, here's lymphoma. Glioblastoma, astrocytoma, these are all gliomas. So seven of the eight in this cluster are gliomas. Again, interestingly, the most malignant glioblastoma, often it looks like a small blue cell tumor, um, uh, um, clusters with lymphoma, right? So um, we see multiple levels of organization in this data, which I, which I think is really, really interesting. Now, there's, of course, clusters like here, where you get kind of a, a, a multicolored clustering of the chapters. So here you have a DNET. This is a neuronal tumor. You have a sarcoma, um, liposarcoma, a chondrosarcoma. Chordoma is a kind of different tumor. It's not even in the WHO book. So it kind of group those together. So again, are, are, are these errors, or is there some intelligent reason why these tumors were grouped together? And I think if you ask any neuropathologist or any pathologist, the common feature here is that these are myxoid rich tumors. So they have, they secrete a lot of uh, mucin uh, and perhaps that is what the computer is learning, right? So again, these are um, qualitative for now. Many of these, if you look everywhere, they're, they're, um, you have a metastatic cluster. So here you have metastatic, the, bra the brain is a common area of metastases. You have a metastatic cluster. You have, this is normal salivary gland, then you have your breast, your lung and your colon cancers grouping together. So these are glandular tumors gr uh, grouping together. And these are more, these are molecularly um, uh, proven, right? So um, for, for us to call something a lung cancer, we need to, we need to see expression of a t a TTF1. So these are not kind of errors on our side. These are objectively grouped tumors based on transcription factors that the computer is grouping together based on morphological properties. You have a kind of a sarcomatoid group here, um, anaplastic meningiomas, liposarcoma, sarcoma, high grade. Here's, your, here's what we think is your small blue cell um, cluster. You have your uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. You have your medulloblastoma, small cell carcinoma. So um, lots of these patterns. So how can we start trying to understand um, in an objective way how these groupings are occurring aside from um, you know, having a pathologist hand wave some explanations to you. So now we can use um, some of the features that are found in either all the classes or in specific groups of the clusters to try to address those questions. So um, obviously the, 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 sore, the sore thumb in this whole thing is that you have these features here. So the, um, these are features uh, derived by the neural network that are found in high levels um, in, in all tissue types. So that would um, be tissue that's common, right? So uh, what's common? Uh, let's see. Um, so we find uh, one of these features, 215. And then what we can do, we can play, we can start playing games with these values. So we can say, fetch me, go into the squamous cell carcinoma group and fetch me the tile that has the highest 215 value. And then fetch me also 
the squamous cell carcinoma tile that has the lowest 215 value. And what you see is um, you get these, uh, you get this thing here, and, and you get the low one here. This is obviously tumor, 100% tumor. This is obviously, um, you know, uh, uh, portions of dura, it seems like, um, that have small amounts of tumor in there. So uh, looking at this, um, you, can, you, can, you can think that perhaps it's 215 correlates with fibrosis, which is commonly seen in many uh, um, tissues and especially tumors. But now what we can do is we can use a feature activation map, not a class activation map, but looking at a feature 215 specifically in these tiles. And you can see here um, that um, it's looking at the same thing that I'm looking at, right? So um, it's leaving the, the tumor cells alone and it's focusing on the fibrosis around the tumor. And then when you look at the kind of um, the tile that has low 215, it's not recognizing anything. It's pure tumor. And you can do this now. You can say, okay, well, let's go to a different tumor. So we go to colorectal cancer. Again, you go to the high and the low. In the low, it's pure tumor. There's no fibrosis. In the high tumor, you ask any pathologist. I think they'd say that there's some stromal uh, fib uh, fibrotic element to this. You look at the class activation or the uh, feature activation map. Again, it's labeling, it's leaving the tumor cells alone. So now what we have is we have a feature in the neural network that correlates with fibrosis, right? So we're, we're, we're getting somewhere um, but to try to understand how computers are, are making these decisions. Here's another feature, uh, 369, again, found in practically all of our classes. Um, you play these games. So here's a malignant melanoma. Find the uh, malignant melanoma tile that has a high feature 369. You get almost pure blood and then some, some melanoma here. Um, and then you go to the low uh, and you can see that uh, in the low, uh, when 369 is low, there's very little blood in this section, right? So we can start to correlate feature 369 with blood. And you can go to lung adenocarcinoma and go find me the um, find me a slide that has a high 369. This particular one had these kind of small blood vessels, and you can see the feature activation map again labels very very accurately the the small blood vessels in, in the tumor. So we're starting to now uh, correlate individual features uh, in the neural network in this black box with kind of human understandable features. Now let's go to cluster specific features. So here's our meningioma cluster, and then we see that these features here are lighting up in this cluster alone. And then when you kind of scroll up and scroll down visually, there's very few other tumors that have this particular feature. So this particular feature may have some human understandable uh, um, correlate uh, in the ways that humans group meningiomas. So again, we go to the, uh, we use 230, which was one of these features. We go to the high level ones, and then you can see hopefully that the, the, the tumor cells are whirling, they're forming these whirls. That's the kind of diagnostic feature of meningiomas. And, and you can do this across all the classes, right? So um, atypical, somomatous, uh, these are super whirls. They're forming calcifications because they were whirled so tightly. Um, so if you're high, you have whirls. And then if you're low, you kind of get a more spindled uh, kind of architecture in the meningioma. Conversely, feature 346, which was also found here, shows another feature of meningioma, which is um, a spindled morphology, right? So again, you go through the same groups of images, but instead of looking for high 230, you look for high 340, 349, and what you find is that you get spindled morphology uh, across these classes. And then even if, and then you go to the low, and what you see is, uh, in some of them, you can see very nice whirls. So we now have full control about what the, we, 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 we can hopefully have convinced you that we have a nice uh, control over uh, understanding how the neural network is making at least some of these decisions. So here's that kind of weird uh, grouping that was, um, I tried to convince you was based on uh, kind of a mucin rich um, feature. Um, so we can now use these kind of uh, tricks to try to prove that that's the case. So we go to this uh, cluster here and we kind of can visually or kind of computationally find which features are high in this cluster and low and uh, relatively low in the other in the other tumors right so we zeroed in on these guys here one of those features was 382 when you kind of take all the tiles in that class and you and you draw a violin plot about the intensity of feature 382 in those classes you can see that um, these, um, uh, these classes within this uh, cluster are very high. And then if you go outside the cluster, 
um, feature 382 is very low. So, right? so this is a kind of uh, objective um, enriched feature in these classes. Now, but notice here that when you go to these kind of um, gliomas and subependymomas, you do have a, a, a sharp tail that has, uh, th that would suggest that there's tiles that have a high feature 382. So we can look at those. So here's an uh, uh, anaplastic oligodendroglioma, high feature 382. I see a mixoid thing here, uh, and I don't see mixoid here, right? And you can see that exactly where this discoloration is occurring, that's where the computer is detecting feature 382, um, showing that these highly correlate with um, um, uh, uh, what we understand to be a, a, a kind of mucin under the microscope. And you can see here, this subependymoma is actually forming kind of these uh, vacuoles of mucin, and you can see the feature activation maps um, o o almost overlay with these um, mucin-rich um, uh, uh, areas. Uh, now, there's kind of more complicated um, um, patterns, too, that exist here. So we're going to our metastatic cluster here, uh, and we see multiple different features. So what do those features represent? So here is kind of a, um, an image. You have some stroma. You have your epithelial lining of this uh, uh, um, colon cancer, and you can see that um, now we can pick out multiple uh, deep learning feature 165, deep learning feature 66, that are enriched in, the, in this cluster that probably what, were, were, what, what caused these tumors to cluster together. And you can see that it's exclusively focusing on the epithelial portion of this, of this image. Now, uh, we looked further. Uh, uh, there's obviously more than two here. And in some cases, uh, you, you see some really interesting patterns. So uh, feature 45 and feature 436, uh, when you do the feature activation maps, you see that instead of it labeling the epithelium, it's labeling the kind of uh, um, secretions in the lumen just, just beside the epithelium. So we think that this is a luminal correlate. So um, that's very, very nice to see uh, this kind of complementary of features. The same way if I look at a gland, it's kind of like a donut. I need to see both the, the dough and the, and, 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 and the hole in the middle, right? So we see that the computer is learning the same way. It's using multiple features in the image that make sense to the human to make these uh, kind of groupings. And here's 215, this is our fibrosis correlate, and you can see that it's labeling the fibrosis rather than the epithelium or the kind of luminal structures. Um, you can generalize this, so we kind of created a new cohort. Um, you can see that even though I was showing you 500 micron um, um, tiles, this is very, very nicely preserved through much larger areas of tissue. So the whole slide will look like this. It will, um, features um, 66 and 165 will label the epithelium very, very cleanly. You go to the lumen feature, again, very, very clean. These aren't the kind of um, hand-selected areas. Um, you can see here, um, uh, uh, very, very clean throughout the whole slide. Here's your fibrosis, again, uh, labeling the kind of fibrostroma uh, associated with this tumor. The nice thing about this is that you can now look at these individually. You don't have to use the whole neural network. You can, you can, you can mute things that you think are uninteresting. So um, here's a kind of independent cohort. We're just looking at one feature at a time, 382. We see that it's high in chondrosarcomas again, as we saw in our, in our training data, and much higher than the other tumors. Here's our epithelial feature, um, um, very high in adenocarcinomas in our, in, our, in our testing set, very, very low in other tumor types. Now the beauty is that things like blood and things like fibrosis, if you're not interested in those, you can, you can dial those to zero and, and still uh, uh, cluster the data um, uh, with hand-selected features that are of interest to you. Um, so um, the nice thing about these is that now that we know what they are, you can translate them into tumors that you've never trained the neural network before. So here's a pancreatic adenocarcinoma I got from one of my colleagues. And you can see again, these epithelial features label the epithelium of the pancreatic adenocarcinoma as expected. Um, the luminal features uh, label um, components of the luminal features of the pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And again, the fibrosis uh, labels the fibrotic components. So uh, very, very um, uh, nice features you can quickly move to other applications um, and still maintain that understanding of what the computer is quantifying. Um, we've done this with TCGA as well. Um, so this is a kind of lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, you do lose some of the kind of 
um, performance of some of these, but um, it, uh, you know, it seems to be preserved. Uh, you get the, the epithelial um, features label the epithelium, the luminal features label the luminal aspects, and then you have your fibrotic features label the fibrotic elements of kind of these independently scanned and created uh, images. Um, and again, this is just kind of looking at individual epithelial features, very, very high in, um, in the epithelial tumors of the uh, uh, TCGA database and low in the other kind of non-epithelial um, uh, cancers. Uh, and then again, you can group, you can use these to group um, uh, TCGA cases into interesting classes that share histological features. Um, so one thing, uh, uh, just to kind of end, uh, end off here, um, we learned about this glioma classification. So um, uh, classifying gliomas based on this fried egg and uh, um, uh, potato um, structure is, is kind of, it's, it's kind of the bread and butter um, uh, neuropathologist's job here. So I look for these kind of paranuclear halos to make a, to, to understand what a oligodendroglioma is and, and order the appropriate molecular tests. And then if I see a more potato-like structure, I may not order those. And so when you train the neural network on these types of images, um, you can again create these um, heat maps of different deep learning feature vectors. And then you can again try to predict which features are, um, correlate with oligodendroglioma. So here in the second track here, um, uh, th this cluster here is your oligodendrogliomas. This is your astrocytomas. Um, these have fried eggs. These don't. So you can look at which features are exclusive to this, uh, to these two tumors. So it's probably somewhere here. Uh, if you look at those features, uh, you're going to find features uh, that um, are enriched in the oligodendroglioma class. So um, huge heterogeneity here, right? So uh, these features are overlapping, and that's what, why. We move to molecular to do this, but when you um, when you uh, take some of these features like 153 and say find me a oligodendroglioma with a high feature 153 enriched in these tumors, uh, you see you get this fried egg appearing pattern, and then in the low one you you kind of get this more fibrillary pattern that's uh, more more common in astrocytomas. Same thing with astrocytomas. Find me the astrocytoma with the highest feature 153. This this fried egg correlate, you get these fried egg appearing cells in the, in, in the tumor tissue, and then if you dial it down low, you, you get the more fibrillary pattern. You show this case, we showed this case to six um, neuropathologists, they all said this was an oligodendroglioma, this was an astrocytoma. We showed this case, oligodendroglioma, this, so this, this low, this low tal here is an oligodendroglioma. You show this to any neuropathologist, they're going to say, I bet you this is an astrocytoma. So, um, this again just shows that we're able to um, uh, pick out specific features that we understand very well and in fact can be tricked by dialing up or down these uh, specific features. So I'll stop there. Uh, I just kind of in summary uh, wanted to uh, show you that uh, there's a lot of interesting insight um, that can be learned by comparing pathologists uh, interpretations of slides and, 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 and machines and I think um, we're hoping that this is going to play a key role in the kind of grand plan of uh, introducing these technologies into medical image analysis. And by, by kind of correlating some of the machine engineered features to human understandable constructs, we think that uh, we're improving the transparency that's needed uh, for this transition. So I'll stop there. I'll thank my team. Um, Kevin uh, kind of led a lot of the computer uh, computational component of this project, a very talented computer science student uh, here at U of T.